so this meeting is being live streamed. Got it. Okay. I'm not even skilled enough to know how to do all the fancy recordings. So we'll just have to worry about that later. All right. Sorry, one second as I get all set. Welcome to Break the Silence. Okay, it just popped up on our Facebook. Yay, okay, we figured it out. It's like an hour late, but better late than never, they say, right? Okay, so we are live with Break the Silence. This is our first official um, interview for Break the Silence. This is something that the Lord has put on my heart to start. And um, if you're new here and if you're just tuning in, I'm sorry we're an hour late. We now have figured out a lot of the um, issues that go along with using technology to talk about really important issues. We also, me and Heather also believe that there's possibly some warfare involved, um, some kind of interference because like we have tried everything and even normal um, things that should be working or not working. So thank you for your patience and sticking with me. Okay, we are here this week with Heather, and I just want to say that if you enjoy what you see today, next week we will be live with um, Lois Ridley. She's a licensed professional counselor um, speaking on child raising from her 20 years of ministry experience in counseling, and that will be at the same time, but on time, like nine o'clock, not an hour late. So today I have Heather with me, and Heather is a woman that I love so dearly. She has been such a powerful person in my life, uh, very impactful in my life and my spiritual walk. Um, a little background on Break the Silence, and I'll get into who Heather is in a minute. Um, Break the Silence is, um, if, you've, if you were on last week, I did a whole teaching on Break the Silence and what it's all about, and there's different things that get in the way of us speaking our testimony and sharing what's um, what like deeper struggles that we go through. Um, I feel like this year is a year to break the silence, campaign against isolation and scorn the shame of stigma as we rally together to normalize the human experience captivated by his love, okay? So last week we did this, we laid the foundation, Philippians 319, we talked about the destiny of their destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, their mind is set on earthly things and in combating this, we walk as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, okay? And so we talked about stigma being nailed to the cross and um, that Jesus scorned the shame that carries stigma and how we can walk in that. And if you missed it, you might wanna go back on, the, on our page and see that teaching, it's powerful. Um, and so this is why we started Break the Silence and um, we overcome, like according to Revelation 12, 11, we overcome him by the, the, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony and not loving our life unto the death. And so that is what we're here to do today. And with me, I have Heather Williams. So I'm just going to read a little bit about her. I'm going to tell you her bio is um, she's an ordained minister. She's been in ministry for 20 years alongside her husband, Dustin. She's pastored in Utah for 14 years and she's worked with children, youth, young adults, families. She has a heart to see people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and walk in the fullness of who God has called them to be so that they can influence their everyday world. Um, she has a testimony of going through anxiety and having panic attacks. That's some of what we're going to talk about today. She lives in Maricopa, Arizona. She has um, a wonderful husband, Reverend Dustin, and amazing three amazing children who I love dearly. Um, so hi, Heather, welcome. How are you doing today? <laughs> Hi, Millie. <laughs> well, I'm so honored to be here. Um, lots of technical difficulties, but you guys powered through and um, it's such an honor to be here. So thank you for having me. Well, it's an honor to have you and you're my first guest and I'm just so excited. <laughs> Uh, if you love what you see today and you want to connect with Reverend Heather Williams, you can go to um, journeywiththewilliams.blog. It is already linked in the top of this description, so you can check it out. My apologies. I can't see if anybody is tuning in. I don't know if you are commenting, but feel free to comment, share the post, share with people. Um, and if you relate to things, make sure you chime in. If you have prayer requests, make sure you chime in. Okay. So Heather, um, let's just jump right in. What do you say? Let's do it. All right. So you've experienced a lot of anxiety and panic in your life. And today we're going to talk about that um, anxiety, panic, and all those things, like, because it can be embarrassing, right? Like when you go through it, I mean, do you ever feel comfortable just walking into any church and just announcing that you have anxiety? You know, it's not something you would do. So what has the Lord revealed to you in tough times when you have gone through things like that? 
Wow. Well, that is um, such a powerful question, actually. Um, I would say, you know, you hit the nail on the head with, you know, is anybody just going to walk into a church and just air their vulnerable moments? And the answer to that is typically not. Um, right. Usually most people don't want to talk about the vulnerable things. And it can be really hard when you actually do. Um, I remember in Utah when my husband asked me to speak and I really felt like the Lord was calling me to speak on anxiety and my testimony of it. And of course, I mean, you're just nervous, right? I'm the pastor's wife and I get up there and share probably, well, yes, my most vulnerable story and the deep battle that I faced with panic and anxiety and people were shocked. Um, I remember after the message, I can't even begin to tell you how many people came up to us and um, came up to me and said, I have struggled with anxiety for years and I've never told anybody or, hey, I've been on medication for anxiety for years and I've never told anybody. Thank you for talking about it. It was countless people. And I'm not saying that to exaggerate the story. Um, even my husband was shocked at the outcome and it really showed us just how much things like this need to be talked about in the church because honestly I had actually never even heard a sermon on mental health or panic attacks or anxiety um, prior to me speaking on it so I really didn't have a grid for it but I just got up there and shared the story and how God you know brought me through and it was really life-changing for me, actually. Um, there's something mm -hmm. about airing. Um, I don't even know if I want to use the word airing. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's something about sharing uh, those vulnerable things that actually, in a way, bring breakthrough. And I'm not saying talking about it means you're never going to have a panic attack. But it does remove the isolation and the guilt, the condemnation, all the things that the enemy plays with your head and your mind about it. Um, talking about it just really brings a lot of freedom. Yeah, I mean, there's something that happens when um, you are dealing with something and let's say it's taboo for the culture or just in general, socially, you know, you learn, you just don't talk about certain things, right? And so when we, we get in, a, sometimes church can almost resemble that, like just any social setting. And then we jump in and we're like, uh, we learn quickly that people can have reactions or that not everyone experiences maybe that level of anxiety. And so it looks maybe different to them or they don't have the understanding. So, you know, and we could talk about this too. People will say well-meaning things, but then it leads you to overthink or, or think that you are living some kind of other way or when you're not. Hold on, hold on. I'm so sorry, my son walked in. But, you know, it can lead you to really think that you're the only one going through it or that um, it's way worse for you than others. And there's some kind of, I, I don't know if the right word is phenomenon, but it's like a phenomenon when um, you talk and other people relate and then they feel safe to talk too, right? It's kind of culture shaking in a sense. Would you agree? Oh, I would totally agree. And I think, um, you know, even relating back to that day when I spoke about it, I, I still to this day have people commenting to me about that message. And that happened for weeks after. It was like, hey, Heather, can I set up a meeting with you? I want to talk about this. And a lot of them had never actually shared about their struggle in a church setting. And um, which brings up, you know, a great topic of how at times there have been certain subjects that, you know, have a stigma or a taboo. And so they aren't talking about it. But I really feel like the church needs to be the one to talk about these things, because if we aren't, then the world's going to be the one to drive the narrative on it. And we, we need to be the light and, the, you know, shine in the darkness, basically. And, you know, there, there comes a point, you know, where certain topics you probably need to address, you know, maybe in a more intimate setting or things like that, but still removing the stigma 
I just feel is very important for the church to do that. Right, right. That's a good point. Um, I mean, if ever there was a place that you should be comfortable to talk about things, it should be the church, right? And mm -hmm. then at the same time, you know, this is, I think, why discipleship is important, right? Because right. there's a lot of uh, enmeshment that can happen if we are not kind of faithful to accountability in some way, would you say like, I, you know, like if I just go demand every person, <laughs> you know, for different issues and no one really gets to know me, you know, that also can um, worsen our issues at times, worsen anxiety. You know what I mean? Because you don't grow in relationship with accountability and then how much discipleship is really happening, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, there are those times where, um, you know, somebody might get saved and they just have immediate breakthrough of, you know, the, you know, delivered of alcoholism or, you know, other addictions just on the spot. And then there are times where people get saved and they're still walking through their mess and they're still walking through things that have a hold on them. And, you know, to go back to your point of discipleship, discipleship has to be a thing because we can't just get people saved mm -hmm. and expect you know, they can't expect, oh, well, I know Jesus now, so everything's going to be peachy. It's right. actually probably the other way, right? Because all hell's going to be coming against them to be like, you know, what are you thinking? Why'd you turn to Jesus? And, you know, it's like they turn, they turn the heat, you know, hell turns the heat up on them, right? Mm -hmm. And so if there's not that discipleship and that sound biblical teaching and foundation, um, it's really hard for people to come into church with their mess yeah. when, you know, it just, you know, you couldn't have said it any better. Discipleship just really needs to be a thing. It's true. It's true. And, you know, it's, it's like, we, we have great models for uh, like salvation models, you know, like let's, let's get people the gospel. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, I think a lot of communities are still navigating the discipleship model. You know what I mean? And, and it's different for cultures. It's different per community. You know what I mean? It could look different, but it's really important that we don't neglect it altogether or that we're just on the journey to learning how to do that well. And part of it is this. A part of it is the advocacy where people need to know and not be afraid of people saying, I have anxiety, right? Uh, or, you know yeah. what I mean? Let them down or give them well-meaning things but out uh, like out of context that are not going to apply or help or make life better in fact it could even make things worse so yeah. can I give you an example on that go ahead so um there was somebody in my life that I had actually shared with that I was having anxiety and this okay. was prior to me publicly you know preaching about it mm -hmm. and they were so well-meaning, but the way it landed just was really tough. And they said, well, you must have sin in your life. Must. And must. you must. Well, <laughs> yes, I am a sinner. Like, I will admit that. But I think they were thinking like something, you know, like hardcore or moral failure or something, you know, like, um, and I was like, you know, don't, don't fool yourself. Like, I've already asked God that because when you're suffering, you're examining literally everything. When you're begging for God to take something away from you, you're, trust me when I say like, you are, you're your own worst critic, right? Mm -hmm. And not to say that we don't have blind spots, but you know, I did ask God that. And I was like, do I have sin in my life? You know, what have I done to deserve this anxiety? And, you know, it was, thankfully I knew they loved me and it was well-meaning but it was not the right thing to say because it was like, well, you got a word because I, I mean, I've asked the Lord, <laughs> you know, right. and, you know, you don't want to say it was like Job's comforters, you know, like, or his friends when they're trying to comfort him and they're doing everything, but saying the right things, you know, and it's just, sometimes people try and they just really miss the mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really good example because, um, maybe we can even work on resources that help people minister to people with anxiety, right? Because mm -hmm. I imagine that it, like, cause I, I have had it. So I, 
I get it, but I can't imagine what it's like to have not had anxiety and try to minister to someone who has it, right? Because then I might be tempted to just pull out a scripture and say, oh, where's the sin in your life, right? Because it doesn't look like something fruitful. But, you know, if, if you wouldn't do it to someone with a physical ailment, you shouldn't do it with a mental health issue. That's my stand. Well, exactly. Yeah, I I so relate to that because it's um it's just funny because it's like people people will say, "Oh, well, you have sin in your life." Or um you know, one time I was with a close friend having a panic attack again, well meaning, and they said, "Well, just distract yourself." Well, trust me, I tried that. Like right. that doesn't work. Like when your mind is spiraling, you know, yeah. and it's 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 something I would never even wish on my worst enemy. Not that I have enemies, but you know what I'm like that saying goes like, I would wish panic and fear and anxiety on no one. Right. Because in the moment, all you're doing is spiraling and you can't get out of it, you know? Yeah. Right. Like if, you know, and eventually, you know, you come to a point where you have coping mechanisms, you've learned, okay, my heart racing is not going to kill me. Right. This is not a heart attack. Right. Like you go down all the, the spiraling loop. Um, but you know, just, well, just distract yourself. Well, that doesn't work. Well, unfortunately this friend of mine that told me, well, just distract yourself about two years later, they called me in tears and they're like, I've been experiencing panic attacks severely. And I'm so sorry. I ever told you to just distract yourself because that does not work. (laughs) And they told me, you know, I tried, I remember, you know, I remembered how I told you, well, distract yourself. Well, I tried and it doesn't work. You know, I was like, yes, I am very aware, but I felt terrible. I was so sorry that they were even experiencing that. Right. Well, maybe we, as a church, we need to kind of learn what empathy is a little, (laughs) you know, like I think it well-meaning and I think we've all done it. We, we try to have answers for everything. For some reason, there's this like fear of saying, you know, I don't know, but I'll sit with you. Right. You know, maybe that's the answer. If you have no training in mental health, maybe that's one of the answers and not that you have to enmesh boundaries. And this topic could go like a million different ways, but there's ways to do it where you don't have to have the answers or throw a scripture at someone out of context or assume that they're in sin. You know what I mean? To stand with them, to pray with them. Um, and of course, mental health issues can run, anxiety can be uh, like a symptom of several different deeper um, Mm issues. So, um, you know, if it turns into an unhealthy relationship, you know, like enmeshment and not respecting boundaries and things like that, well, there of course has to be those things in place, but maybe we can destigmatize getting mental health help too. (laughs) You know what I mean? And we, I know you want to talk about that too, but should I- on to the next question then all right so the next question is what do you think is important for the church to understand from what you went through wow well i think um you know i think having walked through the panic attacks and the fear that i did it actually Mm -hmm. gave me an ability to really empathize with people And, um, you know, something that was actually really hard for me at a certain point was as pastors, we would have to sit on the front row of our, of the auditorium for Sunday services. And there was a point where I could not sit through service. And it was like almost every time that the preaching would start, I would just get this terrible panic attack. I'd have to leave because of course, when you're spiraling, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to die in front of this entire church and they're all going to see it. Right (laughs) now that sounds ludicrous. And, you know, but when you're in the moment, it's like, it's your reality. Like your perceptive, your perception has become your reality. And, um, that's just a really hard, hard thing. And I remember going to my pastor And I was like, at the point where I was like, okay, I'm going to have to tell him because I'm literally the last four weeks I've left every time he's gotten up to the pulpit. Like that at some point, like we need to have a conversation. Right. And because I didn't want him, you know, he just had to know. And, um, I just remember him looking at me and he goes, you know what? He goes, I've only had two panic attacks in my life. 
but they were the worst thing ever. And I thought I was going to die. And he said, you, you take the time that you need to heal and no pressure. And he's like, I'm, I'm here. I'm here for you. And, you know, he went on to give me some encouragement, like, Hey, have you seen your doctor? You know, all the great fatherly things that I really appreciate. Um, but he was there to sit with me in my mess. And, you know, I was on staff, right? Like it was embarrassing talking to him, you know, it's embarrassing. Yeah. You know, being so vulnerable, it can be right. But again, that goes with removing the stigma. So I think as far as the church, like we just have to be willing to sit with people like in the Bible. I love how the Bible says, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice mourn with those who mourn. And when people need, when people are walking through a mess, like I want to be known as somebody that I will sit with you in your mess because I've been a mess, right? (laughs) I've, I've, it's okay. Like we all need each other. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean every time I had a panic attack, I called up my whole church and was like, hey, guys, I'm struggling. You know, it wasn't like that. I had my close, close people that I could rely on during a panic attack. But just being willing to sit with people in their mm-hmm. mess and to have grace, yeah, I think is just a really important thing because we have to get past this. I have to be perfect for God to use me. So let me put on a front. Let me make you think everything's okay. Um, and again, I'm not saying everybody needs to know all your laundry, but you do need to have people in your life that can, again, sit with you in your mess. And I know I keep saying that, but I don't, I don't know any other word for it and it's okay to not be okay. Right. Like just don't stay there. (laughs) You know, I knew I wasn't okay, but Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't stay that way either. Right. And that's a whole nother dynamic too, that you mentioned being on staff, being in ministry. And that's a dynamic I really want to cover with this series because, um, wow, (laughs) just wow. Being a a human in ministry, how is that possible? You know, uh, Heather, I thought you floated around your house and, (laughs) um, you know, not only, you know, I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't think of ministers as people that, you know, don't have any struggles, but it right. is responsibility to, you know, like you said, you had accountability, you had counsel in your life and trustworthy counsel. And so it's important mm-hmm. to have those things like we were mentioning. And that, and that's just something that you know, when someone comes into the church, they might not even know how the church structure is, mm-hmm. you know, it's different across the board, you know, it's not McDonald's. <laughs> so <laughs> not one menu for every, so, you know, depending on the denomination and the kind of church that they get involved in, um, discipleship looks different, but not a lot of people are going to think when they have that first encounter. uh, um, Like I know that when I became a Christian, I actually felt the presence of God in a tangible way. I felt the, 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 his embrace. And I remember that I didn't have a word for discipleship. What I had, my word for it was what are you guys doing? Like, well, how many times do you meet? Like, what denomination are we? Like, what does this mean? You know, and those are the kind of questions you're going to get when someone's hungry for the the discipleship. And that in that dynamic is where those deeper issues are going to come to the surface over time, when trust is built and all these things. Would you agree? Oh, I would agree. And I think, you know, a lot of times, even when you go into church, like you're, um, you know, you're not going to be best friends with everybody. Right. right? But there is a seat at the table for everyone. And if you give it time, people will, you'll find the people you connect with and you're going to find the people that, you know, feels like, wow, like this is what I've been waiting for. And, but inside of that too, like, you know, that involves putting yourself out there you can't expect everyone to come to you. You can expect everyone to invite you, you know, you, and that stuff's hard, you know, especially coming from a non-church setting. Like how, like you said, how does this stuff even work? Right. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so a, it's, yeah. Let, let people know they have to reach out, but yeah, it's, and then our leaderships also have to know, you know, not everyone knows church structure, you know? So it comes yeah. it's like, it just, 
back and forth, right? Right. That's awesome. Um, you ready for the next question? Yes. <laughs> All right. So how can, you can tell this is my first interview, right? <laughs> how can we change to the deficit areas within the body of Christ? So we're talking about some of the deficit areas like right now, like, um, you know, people not knowing, you know, when and where to talk about anxiety and should we, I mean, I didn't even have this in the notes, but if you're okay answering an off the cuff question, like, should we be preaching about this from the pulpit? Should, you know what I mean? Like what is really going to bring change to the deficit areas? How can we advocate for people to, to feel like the church is a safe place to not be some immaculate person? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, uh, yeah. And I think it goes back to, um, I think the church should be talking about hard things yeah. and the things that people are facing today, because, you know, like I said earlier, if we don't, the world will be the one driving the narrative yes. and we, we cannot allow that. And, um, you know, I heard, um, you know, uh, Patricia King, which were, you know, I know you know her, but she once upon a time, <laughs> yeah, uh, she has such wisdom, but she once upon a time said, you know, um, as the church goes, so goes the nation. Wow. And I love that because, you know, we, we have actually seen the church be silent on a lot of topics and we now see the narrative being very heavily handed yeah. and played by, by the world. And I, I do happen to be of the opinion, you are very welcome to disagree with me, but I um, do happen to be of the opinion that because the church has been silent on some things, um, mm -hmm. our voice has become not very loud and right. it's not the main voice that is being heard. Uh, you know, I was thinking, um, you know, my kids just started going back to school. And so I was thinking, you know, back in the day, like when my grandma went to school, my mom, you know, it was not uncommon for them to pull out a Bible during class, right? Like it was a foundational book, but mm -hmm. as you can see, you know, we all know the state of things now. I won't unpack all of that right now, but, you know, because whatever happened to make the Bible, you know, not become a main book at a school or in the school system, um, the Bible is not loud right now. And right. the church, um, you know, it just makes me what would have happened, makes me wonder what would have happened had, had that have been fought for harder. Right. And, and is it too late? Right. You know, well, yeah. one of my, as you know, is social work and mm -hmm. I study these things. So a lot of the, uh, the vision for social work, which is how a lot of the issues, no matter how we view it on, on any side of, of political spectrums, it's like how they do it is they get involved in every sector of society, right? They, there's a place of advocacy in some of the major businesses. And this is simply how social work has done it. And, and so I think it's brilliant, but I think it's not too late for the church. So get involved, right? Get involved in your communities, get involved in societies as, as a Christian voice, um, be as Christian social worker in, in a sense, right? So it's like, um, like you said, you put your children in school um, and there's a lot of things, a lot of issues that you feel like the voice of the church is kind of silenced on. Is it too late? What do you think? I don't think it's too late at all. I actually, you know, I know you know me on a personal level, but I really love the church. And I know, I know you know that, like, you know, we've given our lives to it. Right. And um, I love pastoring. I love the, you know, I love the big church. I love the little church, you know, I love the dynamics that I love the church and I don't in any way think that I don't think the church is, you know, big C, right. I don't think they have purposely tried to be silent. Um, I don't think anybody wants that. I just right. think it kind of was a subtle thing that happened over time. And, um, you know, and there are, people that are just very vocal about things and, and it's more than just being vocal, right? Like it's, it's discipleship, it's mobilization, it's outreach, it's evangelism. Like it's so multi-layered. Um, but I do not think it's too late for the church. I don't, I don't think, 
um, Jesus is in heaven thinking, oh man, they blew it. Like, what are we going to do now? You know, like right. he, he's not surprised. And I think God's actually getting ready to set the church up for a pretty cool um, end time platform. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm actually very hopeful. I'm hopeful for the church. I'm hopeful when I say church, big C, like, you know, <laughs> um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And that's what I want tonight is I want this message to be hopeful, right? Because there is hope. There is hope for the world. There is hope for people struggling with anxiety and panic attacks. Like, you know, and it's crazy. Like you turn on the news. I stopped watching the news because (laughs) it is so depressing. And if you, if you really let it get into your head and, you know, in your ears, it's like, oh man, well, all hope's lost. Like what, you know, Jesus should just come back right now. I mean, that would be great. I'd be okay with that. Um, But you know what I'm saying? Like I had to remove um, what was causing me some um discouragement and it was just not good things I was listening to as far as the news go right so like I had to just turn it off because I didn't want that to become I didn't want to lose my faith of there still being hope right and some people can watch the news and they're fine I just I didn't realize I had it on like in the background you know, and I'm like, oh man, why am I getting critical? Why am I getting so like Debbie Downer, you know? <laughs> so you, you noticed a link between anxiety and what you were allowing to be part of your atmosphere regularly. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, even now I don't listen to the news, but back as well, when I was struggling with anxiety, I, I couldn't listen to um things that would trigger me and I don't like the word trigger because it makes me sound like a victim or like why well, I should be catered to like that's not my you know like I don't ever want to come off like that but I just I do think there's wisdom you know like before my kids go to school in the car in the morning I pray God protect their eyes their ears their heart their feet their mouth And, um, it's just important to protect what you're listening to, because when you're listening to a lot of doom and gloom things, that does not help give you any peace. And when somebody is struggling with anxiety and fear and panic, you want to eliminate things that can perpetuate the panic and fear. (laughs) I actually recently found that if I go through something that I feel is making me anxious, I will put my, uh, I have a Pandora station. Well, I have several Pandora stations that are just worship. And I plug my headphones in and I realize like, it's even different than if I'm just playing it in the room, than if I have it in my, like, I actually have to have it loud in my brain and it, and it helps. And so call me crazy, call me, you know what I mean? Whatever you want, but I'm telling you, it makes a difference when you just do this like worship IV into your brain when you're having like anxiety or take a moment to step away from the, you know, what's stressing you. I'm thinking specifically from my own demographic, right? We all kind of think through our own perception first. And for me, being a mom can, can cause some things like that at times because, you know, when, when the kids are just like loud and everything's going on. So your kids are getting a little older now, but I still have three little ones and not just that worship IV going in and it just reminded me of everything you were saying with them just changing the atmosphere you know what I mean Mm -hmm. yeah that was actually one of my coping mechanisms actually um was putting worship on like that was definitely one of my go-tos oh so I think that's the next question so let's just get to that right now Regarding your experience, even facing anxiety in ministry, which we talked a little bit about, um, you were staff at a church and had gone through that while you were supposed to be up there, you know, ready to serve and then bam, it hits or it was already hitting and you had to go up there. Um, How did the Lord bring you through and what practical steps did he show you or did you employ to maintain and preserve function in your family and ministry? I know that's a lot of words. Wow. (laughs) That's, um, yeah. So. I will say, um, 
So when I first started having panic attacks, I actually was advised to go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor because I actually had no idea like what was happening. I was, um, I was actually 18 when I experienced my, when I began my season of panic attacks that were severe. And then um, they stabled off for a while, came back when I was 24, stabled off for a while, came back when I was 28. So it's been this, you know, for a while, it was just this on again and off again thing. And so I remember going to the doctor and um, it was really good. Like he assured me, you know, you're not dying. This is what this is. And um, I actually came to do a lot of research. Um, You know me, you know, I'm a researcher. So I was looking everything up, everything I could learn about fear and panic and anxiety attacks. I was learning it because I wanted to understand it. And I will say that um, sometimes that helped, sometimes it didn't, right? But I did go to, the one thing that did help was I, I went to the doctor and I had my blood work done. And I found out that anxiety attacks actually can um, be a symptom of low B vitamin, low D vitamin, um, a thyroid issue, and I believe I'm forgetting the fourth one off the top of my head. Uh, But anyway, I needed to have a blood panel done to see if there were any underlying issues. And all my blood work came back good. So it was easy to say, okay, that's not the issue. Um, So I actually ended up staying in touch with under the supervision of a doctor um, because I knew I was going to need help outside of what my brain was able to do. And I ended up actually um, going through counseling. Um, I chose to do the counseling route once I knew my blood work was okay. Um, So I did counseling for a while and um, I'm a big advocate of both of those things. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think when you're working with a doctor that you trust, and that's a big deal, um, you need to find somebody that aligns with how you want to do your health care, that's going to be supportive, not pushy, yeah. you know, all those things. Um, I know that should go without saying, but I felt it worth saying because not. Oh, it definitely needs to be said. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you need, you know, a good doctor that fits a good counselor that fits. Um, I had an incredibly supportive husband who, um, you know, it was just hard. And then we found out when I was pregnant, actually, um, I had not had panic attacks for years. And then when I got pregnant, I had what was called, and I don't know if there's a professional word for this, but basically the hormones caused me pregnancy induced anxiety. And it was because my hormones were fluctuating so bad. So every time I was pregnant at certain stages of the pregnancies during the hormone surges, the hormone, you know, when they crash, um, I would get anxiety. So knowing that, and my doctor knowing that it was, it was a process, but I didn't feel like I was alone in it. And then also with having, you know, my pastor that was very steady and very encouraging. Um, he had gone through some battles himself, uh, with depression. And so, although he couldn't relate on the panic attack side, you know, the depression obviously gave him a lot of empathy. So Mm -hmm. as far as, um, managing, you know, my husband, um, was just really phenomenal. And like I said, that my doctor and, and pastor, and so, you know, balancing work you know, I continue to work full time in ministry. I continue to be a mother. Um, you know, I don't know. Can I jump on the medication topic right now? Let's go. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's go. <laughs> let's do this thing. So, um, you know, when I, when I go ahead, sorry, <laughs> no, you're okay. Um, when I, uh, spoke about, about this at our church for the first time, I did touch on the sub- subject of medication. And what I said in that was, if, if medication is something that you and your doctor and, you know, between you and the Lord and the doctor, you feel like that's something you need, then you need to be free to 
to to have the medication. Now, for me, we uh, there was a whole various things that I won't get into, but uh, we ended up not going the route of medication because it actually amplified my anxiety, the idea of it. And so, you know, but my doctor was very, he's like, you know, Heather, if there comes a day where like, you're not getting out of bed, you can't function, you can't mother, then I'm going to probably uh, push, highly encourage you, you know, and I knew he was doing it from a place of like, I'm not trying to be a dictator, you know, but he, you know, and he also, which I love this, he's like, even if you did go on this medication, like you are not going to be on this for life. Right. But sometimes with the way the brain works and, you know, I'm sure somebody more professional can, is listening to me being like, oh, she's using all the wrong terms, but oh, there's right, actually go ahead. What's that? <laughs> you're doing it exactly right. Okay, good. I'm like, you can clean up this mess when I'm done, but basically the way the synapses work and the neural pathways, you know, you dig those neural pathways enough and more, you know, repetitively consistently, yep. those need some, you know, rewiring and, you know, there is medication to help with that. And so, you know, I remember on that Sunday, I had said, here's the deal. Like, if you ever came to me and said, I need to be on antidepressants, I'm not going to judge you, right. you know, or anti-anxiety medicine. I'm not going to judge you because here's the thing. If a diabetic were to come up to me and say, I have to go on insulin, I'm not going to tell them, well, you should pray harder. Right, right. Should they pray? Absolutely. Like, please pray. Like, God can heal you. He will. Like, I'm all for all of that. Yes. But I just think, um, you know, like, I, it is not my business if you're on medication. You don't have to share that with me. Um, you know, but it doesn't mean you have to stay on it either. Like, and that was what I loved about my doctor. He's like, this will not be a lifetime thing. Like, I promise you, I will pull you off these. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I said, we ended up not, I, I felt before the Lord and like I said, other medical reasons that I was not to go on it. So I didn't, but that being said, I don't, you know, that just has to be a decision between you and the Lord. Right. Right. That's, um, that's a big topic. I mean, I think we could do a whole, uh, one of these on that alone medications, because it's, it's just still so stigmatized in a lot of ways. And so not only are there people that have differences of opinion, but then there's fear, there's fear over the topic. Right. Um, and, and then of course there could be possible social repercussions for someone knowing if you're on medications or, and so is that acceptable? Absolutely not. You know, <laughs> it's not acceptable. Um, cause even, even if you're not pro medication, you shouldn't be dictating for other people in my opinion. Um, but I was on medications and I'll tell you that it's a big decision. Uh, mm -hmm. you shouldn't judge someone that's going on medications because when I was on medications, the side effects for a lot of them, this is not to scare anyone from going on medications. The side effects are potentially horrendous for a lot of them. I had been on medications for the side effect of medications because the, the, I had locked jaw and at times insomnia, at times I was sleeping all the time and it was, it takes a journey. So whenever you make that commitment, you actually need more prayer support than average or than you, you would might normally have because you're about to embark on a big journey. They're going to try different medications on with you and see what works for you. And there, it could be, you know, a road to walk down. And I know that there are times that God used medications in my life. And I say that unashamedly, I, I feel like God really used it in my life to keep me um, around until he can impact my life in a, you know, in, in the way that he did. And the reason why I feel like God had to, you know, take me in a journey where I came off meds was because um, for me, it became idolatry. I really started to believe that I needed them to survive and not even just for treatment, but I just had this warped relationship with them. And so I think the Lord had me come off. But I always say, even in my book, I'm like, guys, I'm not saying I'm not anti-medication and make sure if you are on meds and you feel to wean off, you have to do it with the supervision of a professional um, don't just jump off, you know, <laughs> like go to your doctor and make sure you tell them, Hey, God's healed me. I'd like to come off my meds and they will wean you off. If, if, 
you know, under medical supervision, but, you know, medications are not actually designed, you know, when we're, when we're in the schooling and I'm not a mental health professional at this time. Um, I want to make sure I make that statement because I do want to pursue licensure in the future. And I don't want to be flagged for saying things as if I'm a doctor or something like that. I'm not, uh, but I am studying about it a lot and it's not designed to be long-term. It's designed to be for the duration of treatment. Sometimes people endure traumatic events. They can't process right in that moment really well. And so medications help. Like if someone close to you passes away, antidepressants can help you through that season, get into counseling, work through things, stay connected to your church, run toward your church. You know what I mean? Don't, mm-hmm. don't isolate, don't, you know, get all shame and stigma, you know, just work it out, have accountability with you. And so I agree with you hundred percent. I think medications are a beautiful thing. I don't believe they're designed to be long-term, but there are some people that without the hope of Jesus do need them long-term. You know what I mean? Um, I do believe Jesus can heal mental illness too. I, I personally believe that. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm a walking testimony of that. And actually I, um, uh, I just have two more things really quick to say. So on the isolation thing, Um, I did want to touch on that because I do think that one of the enemy's greatest tricks is isolation. And I've told you, I mean, you and I have had this conversation before, but I fully believe it. And someday I'm going to preach a message on it because I do feel like God wants to set people free of isolation and um, feeling like they're alone in what they're going through. And, um, you know, I love that scripture where, I'm forgetting the reference at the moment, but how God sets the lonely in families. Yes. And I love that verse because um, I remember when I was going through the anxiety and, um, and then right before I, when I was about to speak, because my husband had asked me to speak on it before. And I was like, no, like, I can't, I can't do that. Like, I'm not like, no. And um, I remember the Lord speaking to me saying, you have to come out of isolation with this. And as long as you stay in isolation, you are playing right into the devil's hand because mm-hmm. isolation is one of the enemy's greatest tricks. And when the Lord spoke to me, I was like, wow, like that is really the truth. And I had actually started sharing with a few more people, you know, about the anxiety thing and my struggle. And, um, you know, again, sometimes people say well-meaning things and, and it didn't actually make me angry. Um, I'm actually glad I was able to experience it because it's really like, it's okay to tell somebody like, I really don't have words for you right now. I'm just sorry, but I'm here for you. Like, it's okay. Like you don't have to say anything, you know? And that really taught me a lot because even as a pastor, like you want to say the right things. And then that pressure was removed from me because it's like, sometimes you just know nope, people don't need more words. Sometimes right. they just need your presence or knowing that you care. And so I think, um, I think removing the isolation, getting people to come out of the isolation is something God really wants to do um, yes. for people. Yes. I think that's foundational really. Yeah. Because I was teaching on this last week with the, um, the whole vision for break the silence is that, um, and I have the scripture right here, it's Philippians 319. And it's, um, it was talking about what happens. I was talking about what happens when you have to choose between, um, the stigma and submitting in silence to the shame or Mm -hmm. in, in Philippians 319, it actually, well, there's another scripture that says that he scorned shame at the cross. Right. And so when we accept shame, we're actually, you know, and to scorn means to tell it it's invaluable to tell it it's, it's got no place. And when we accept shame, we start thinking these things about ourselves. It's not true about us. He scorned shame. He didn't scorn us at the cross, right? He set us free at the cross. So, so when we, when he scorned shame, but we embrace shame instead of coming out of the silence and coming out of the stigma and, and being free because who Christ has set free is free indeed. Then we kind of can adopt these views about ourselves that can worsen our symptoms, our problems. You know what I mean? Um, right. All of that. When you were saying is it Philippians 319, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, and their mind is set only on earthly things, right? And so we're supposed to set our mind on, on things above, 
right? And so accepting that shame and keeping silent and keeping isolated will start you in this zone where you isolate and you start thinking only on earthly things. And then you get in that, you know, addictions and, and, you know, secular ways of coping, you know, and I'm talking about not just coping skills, but maladaptive addictions and, and things that are not good for you or your family. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So setting things above. <laughs> yeah. Not that that's... Well, right. Well, and I think too, it's important to remember, um, you know, for people that are walking through it, and I just feel led to touch on this. Sometimes you feel like God has abandoned you or right. rejected you again. It's like, well, what's wrong in my life? And, you know, what what's going on? But I love um, Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those, saves those who are crushed in spirit. And yes. that was a life verse for me um, that I had to cling on to because he, he hasn't forsaken it. You know, if you're watching this and you're going through it, like, you know, yeah. God has not forsaken you. Um, yeah. And he's, his plan, like, I really felt like the Lord had told me, um, you know, my plan for you struggling with panic attacks and what you're dealing with right now is victory. And, um, that's exactly what happened for me. Actually, I actually went on a retreat and, um, (laughs) funny thing, I actually couldn't fly to the retreat because I was so, I would have panic attacks on planes and I was going to the retreat by myself. So I had to drive 11 hours to this retreat. And I remember drive but I knew the Lord had told me to go and I remember driving and I was like all right Lord I need two things from you like I need freedom from these panic attacks that's what I need and I also had a an eye issue I was dealing with for like months and I'm like so if you could heal me of both those that would be great and on the very last day they were like hey does anybody need prayer and I so I was like well it's now or never so I jumped in the middle of a group bunch of women I did not know I was like yeah I suffer with panic attacks like you know, totally vulnerable. And I'm like, I'm going to regret this. Well, anyway, um, I actually like nothing, you know, I didn't get like lightning out of heaven or anything crazy, but I actually just felt like this warm peace come over me. And I stepped, you know, they were done praying for me. And this lady comes up to me and she was like, she had like this word of knowledge for me. And she's like, I, when we were praying for you, she was like, I felt like I saw a power washer going through your brain from heaven. And she used words that she would, she was not like a professional, which neither am I, but um, they were words I had learned, you know, neural pathways, all this stuff. She goes, I don't even know what I'm saying right now. But she's like, I feel like God's just washing you. And I was like, really? So um, I felt that like that was a word, right? And so anyhow, um, I'm driving down, I'm feeling all this peace. Well, three days later, we were going on a trip to Hawaii. And, you know, you have to fly. And so that's fine. I've flown to Romania. Like I do it. Doesn't mean I love it. Okay. At the time. And so anyhow, we're, I'm telling my husband, I'm like, God delivered me of panic attacks. And he's like, really? And I was like, yeah. And he's like celebrating, which, you know, is great. So anyway, we fly to Hawaii. We land, we're getting the rental car. And my husband looks over at me and he's like, who are you? And what have you done with my wife? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you realize that was like a four and a half hour flight and not one time did you panic. And I was like, huh, check that out. You know, and I just knew God had healed me. Right. And yeah. um, anyway, his, his plan is victory. And, you know, God's not leaving anybody alone to suffer in silence. That's powerful. And I love yeah. how you, you have such a, um, an empathetic orientation toward this topic you know I get so hyped up about breaking the stigma because and and when I say that I'm not talking to to anybody who is suffering and and is like really doesn't feel like they have the strength to do it but I I I more so want to talk to when I'm saying those things I really want people who do have the strength to rally around those who don't you know what I mean and that's what the whole thing is like you said you you got up and you testified and more people came forward so the more we, we who have strength talk about it, those who don't have strength in this time will feel more comfortable. And then there right. will be a future when, you know, perhaps we don't have strength and there'll be others that have strength, right? Because we're running a race, you know, was right. it possible that a race 
So right. it's a race. It's not a one-stop shop. Although we have great testimonies and people can be healed anxiety in an instant. Um, there are other people that are healed and they go continue the race. Mm-hmm. The race isn't finished yet. <laughs> We're not in heaven. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> heaven to earth but we're not you know fully there yet so we still have the john 16 33 in this world you will have trouble but in me you have peace i've overcome the world so mm-hmm. it's only that we have peace and there's a lot of great tools just like there's healthy food to eat that can help lessen your symptoms of physical things and there's um great coping skills and counseling techniques and things that can be used and employed to help you if you're dealing with mental health struggles so there shouldn't be stigma around these issues. You know, it can be difficult to find a good counselor or therapist. Um, and I always recommend a good Christian one, but yeah. you know, try, try do consultations with a few. Um, I, there's even Christian uh, therapists on psychologytoday.com. <coughs> Pardon me. So how can we um, partner with your vision going forward, Heather, with you and Dustin, what you guys are, <laughs> what's your heart? Well, my heart is, um, my heart is, I just want to see people walking in freedom. And I think because I know, um, the pain of, um, anxiety and panic attacks, I think I, I just want people to be free and to know that there's freedom and to not give up and to not isolate and to be real. You know, and so I think, um, you know, you posted our page, you know, how people, if they want to connect with us, um, you know, they're welcome to join us over there. You know, we do blog posts and videos time to time. We've got a book that'll be, um, it's in the editing, final edit, final uh, editing stage right now, I should say, well, somewhere in there. Um, But anyway, you know, we're just, we just want to get the message of Jesus out and the hope that, that he is, because honestly, uh, I just, you know, everyone needs Jesus. And if my story helps people, um, you know, I'd love to talk with, you know, them or just know that there, there are safe places that you guys can open up to, you know, your pastors, counselors, you know, we've covered that, but just really know you're not alone. Amen. And leaders, don't be afraid to dive into the topic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right. There's a lot of lack in the in the way of uh, knowledge or awareness. And so, I, in in my opinion, I you know I've seen that, um, and I think that we can all grow. You know, we can all open up, and and a lot of what we learn, we learn in our congregations, right? In, in our communities, by being right. there for. Um, I th- I'd say. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. You know what I mean? Like I, right. I, you try to use scripture to comfort someone, even if to a fault, then just not be interested at all. Right. <laughs> Cause that's, that's probably worse, <laughs> but yeah. you know, it with people, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I, you know, all- I strive, I strive to be that person that can sit with people. Do I always get it right? No but I just know how important it is. And if I think if we can all strive to, you know, Jesus sat with the hurting, you know? Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's my example. I want to be that. Amen. And I, I've seen that personally from your life and I'm so thankful for you and your leadership and your obedience to God and um, your uh, bravery and tackling topics that many don't want to talk about. Um, for whatever reason. So you are uh, very special to me. So thank you so much for being on this um, live with me today. Um, we're going to be here on August 17th at 9 p.m. with, like I said in the beginning, with Lois Ridley. She's a licensed professional counselor speaking on child raising, and um, she's going to glean from her 20 years of ministry and counseling experience. We're also going to be covering the topics of mutual respect and relationship, especially in older kids when you're raising older kids. So if you know someone who has older kids, you're going to want to let them know that that's coming out. The graphic will be out shortly for that. And we're just going to close out in prayer unless you have any last words, Heather. No, I'm good. Thank you again for letting me be here. All right. So thank you, Lord, for everyone watching. 
God, I just pray that you open the floodgates. Some people are watching this and you know, I'm feeling right now, I feel like there's people watching this that just need to cry right now while they're watching. It might sound sappy, but I'm telling you, sometimes when God's touching you, he just calls you to release emotion. And I'm telling you that God wants to do that for you. So if you're feeling that urge, if you're feeling like I've been dealing with this, I've been dealing with anxiety, I need a breakthrough. Just don't be afraid to cry in the presence of the Lord. So Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you're opening those floodgates. You're opening those floodgates gates and that um, all kinds of healings for all kinds of disorders, anxiety, depression, and anything people can be suffering with that they might not feel like they have a door or access to mental health help, or Lord, that you would even open the doors for the help that they need. And that you would also heal them in areas that they need to be healed, the traumas that they've experienced that might uh, produce flashbacks or might have wired their brain to react in anxiety and in different ways, or that their chemical imbalances might be off. And Lord, that you are just smoothing all of that out and that you're leading them um, to the right care physicians and and you putting the right people in their path and lord i pray for our churches and our communities that we would be unafraid to talk about taboo topics that we would become even better at discipleship and being open for people who need um, your touch um, in even hard topics you would make us better leaders lord and and obedient to you in the ways that people need us need a touch from you lord that you would help us with discernment and growth and and strategy even for how to come out of stigma how to come out of shame and come out of isolation and come together not forsake the assembling together i thank you lord for all you're doing for every member watching in jesus name amen so um if you guys have a prayer request you guys can email to info at church14.com. You're going to want to check out Heather and Dustin's website. It's Journey with the Williams, I believe. Journey with the Williams blog. Is that correct, Heather? Yes. All right. And we will see you next week, hopefully on time. So part of me is I figure out how to sign off of this because I've never used this platform before. So I'm still learning. Thank you, Heather. Bear with me as I get off of this. Okay. Blessings.